Welcome to lecture 15. We'll be covering launch vehicle applications and how we will take those loads and the processes we discussed to predict the stresses in the system. So again, this is a launch vehicle. And as you recall, we talked about how the loads from the couple of those analyses will give you an axial um, shear and bending moment distribution across the whole vehicle from bottom to top. You can also do it by hand using hand calculations using the preliminary design approaches that were discussed, but those will be more, they'll be more for preliminary sizing. They will not give you the, the, the accuracy that a couple of those analyses will provide. Also recall that a couple of those analyses, the, the, the accelerometer data uh, from testing flight test data, for example, could be used to further refine the analyses and continue to improve the modeling approaches to ensure that we are we have the right load. So then when we put a potentially important payload or we're flying humans that we have a good understanding of the loads across the whole system to make sure that it will survive the ascent environments and the reentry environments if needed. The evaluation again consists of strength, fatigue, fracture, buckling and creep as we discussed in the standards um, portion of the of, of, of the lecture. So tanks can carry only axial and bending loads and pressure. Tanks are analyzed as thin wall structures. The propellant tank is designed to the hoop stress and the loading is due to internal pressure and hydrostatic pressure at maximum flight G loading. What you wanna do is, we already did this before, I showed you how to do it, convert the axial load which you're gonna have a free body diagram done for the bottom to top, but say you're within the tank that's pressurized, you do a cut, get the axial load, you make sure it accounts for the effects of pressure. And I already showed you some of that uh, in a previous lecture. So the axial load and bending load, load are corrected then to get an equivalent load. That equivalent load now that you have that, you can divide that equivalent load by the thin wall cross-sectional area to then get the axial stress. The hoop stress can be easily found by basically the formula stress equals PR over T. But in this case, recall how that pressure P depends upon where you are within the tank because the G loading increases the pressure as well due to hydrostatic pressure. So we covered some of that, but here's a little more detail so you know how to approach it. Tank buckling can be a problem. So the Bickers buckling criteria from pressurized tanks is typically used. And if you have not found the book yet, uh, you wanna download the Brooms book, figure C8114 for pressurized cylinders to determine the proportional increase in strength due to pressurization. Basically, anytime you have pressure inside a tank, the buckling capability will increase. Um, tanks, because they're very thin, they're thin wall structures, they're susceptible to buckling. So, I wanna go to, to the equation here. So the critical buckling load is given, and this is a buckling stress in this case, uh, P critical. Uh, this buckling stress is calculated using uh, the modulus of the material. KS is your, is basically a, 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 a buckling coefficient. This is a buckling coefficient. And here E, T is the thickness, the wall thickness. And then L is the length of the tank. And then nu here is a Poisson ratio. So this is how you calculate your P critical. Then you have to ca calculate a curvature. This is called a curvature parameter Z. So you can have two L squared D, the diameter of the tank times T, and then one minus nu squared. Once you get Z, you plug it in here to get KS. So this is fully known completely, uh, but to, calculate the increase in buckling pressure due to, in buckling strength due to the action of pressure. Because you can imagine if you have a Coke, a, 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 cac, a can of Coke, and it was fully full of fluid, it would be harder to buckle it than something that's not full of fluid. So that's why pressure does play a role. So you plug in here P tank, the pressure in the tank, D tank is the diameter 2TE, and then you come here and you figure out where you are, depending upon where you are, you select the value, delta say is another 15% increase, you plug it in here and this becomes your real 
critical buckling stress due to um, due to the effects of pressure accounted for. And you can see it's always going to increase uh, if there's any amount of pressure in the tank. So that's what is used to calculate for buckling. You want to compare this to see what's more critical. Maybe it's this stress, maybe it's this buckling capability. One of the two will be more critical and you basically have to figure out which one is the most critical. The tank critical bending stress can be found. Uh, the tank bending allowables are determined also from Broom's book, uh, figure C8, 13A.1. The values are bro from Broom were determined from experimental results. Uh, critical bending stress is as follows. You have E, the modulus, times R1 times the diameter of the tank divided by 2T, all of that elevated, uh, elevated to the R2. R1 typically ranges from these ranges like this, and R2 is approximately equal to minus 1.6. So you can do a sensitivity study to determine that critical bending stress uh, for the structure. To determine the increase in bending strength of pressurized tanks, uh, what you want to do is use these formulas. The, again, the pressurized tank will also increase bending strength. So you come here, you have one plus, and you can see here, these are units of stress, clearly. So, so yeah, this is this here is critical bending stress. So you go here and, and it's the same formula as that, but now you're increasing it by this delta CB. Delta CB can be found to be 0 0.06 times the logarithmic, natural logarithmic of this ratio here. And P tank divided by E times, uh, and then this again gives you uh, non-dimensional, this is non-dimensional, so this actually works out very nicely. And so this is what you plug in here uh, to get uh, the effects of pressure accounted for. Intertanks are designed to carry just axial and shear loads. Uh, you can also evaluate for buckling using the very sim similar formula, formula that I discussed, but you won't have that the effects of pressure anymore there. Uh, and now the intertanks are also need to be evaluated for shear. Uh, the shear loading condition can be determined uh, as follows. So we're looking at um, what we're, we're what we're looking for is the stress, the shear stress through one of the shear stringers, one of the stringers here. So let's say this stringer number R. So these are numbered one, two, three, four, five. So stringer number R. So sigma R is a shear stress through a particular stringer, and so. What you want to do, what we're looking for is what's the most critical shear uh, stress? Which stringer is most critical? So this is what this is, this formula here at the bottom. So maximum, which of these is the greatest? And you want to make sure it's less than the ultimate strength. So then that shear stress can be found as the shear uh, flow divided by the thickness, the thickness of the skin. So how do you find QR? QR is found through this formula. S Y divided by the moment of inertia, B R Y R. Uh, I X X is the moment of inertia that I'll show you how to calculate. S Y is the shear force at the shear center. And, and so that's your S Y here, the one you'll find. That shear force you can find through bending moment diagram and shear diagram. Shear diagram is the way you will find it. So you know S Y. You know IXX, because I'll show you how to do that calculation. BR, I'll show you how to do a calculation. And YR, also, I'll show you how to do it. YR is basically the location of the stringer relative to the shear center, which is here in the center here. So, so YR is, is fully known for each of the stringers, so you can find it. And so then I have the moment of inertia, which is this, this mysterious BR, which I'll show you how to calculate. So you take you calculate BR for each of these stringers uh, and then times YR squared. YR is known because you know the location of the stringer. So now I have to show you how to calculate BR. So again, it's a recursive formula, but I'll show you. So BR then becomes BR equals AR, which is the area, cross-sectional area of stringer number R, uh, plus the skin thickness times R, which is I apologize for that. R here, R here is a radius. Theta is the angle between stringers. 
And then yr plus one divided by yr for that particular stringer of interest, you can calculate this ratio here. So yr plus one divided by yr, uh, and then yr minus one divided by yr. So, it, so if you're this one here, you're calculating yr plus one, that height. And if you're this stringer here, you're zero basically. Uh, and, and so you'll then be able to calculate these, these ratios. And then here you have theta over six times the radius of, of the tank, and then you have the thickness. So you have all these numbers, you can calculate BR, and let me go now from top to down so you can see how it works. You calculate BR, plug it in here. YR is known for every stringer. So you can calculate the inertia by adding all this from R equals one to N. So if I have 10 stringers, that's what will go there. Then you will take and find the shear flow for a particular stringer. So that's the total shear force going through that section, SY, divided by the moment of inertia, which is really driven by all the stringers. So then IXX equals all this. Uh, so you're going to have to calculate this, put it in the denominator. You know BR for every stringer because you had this calculation. You have YR for every stringer because you have the height of that stringer. So then you can cal calculate QR. QR divided by the th skin thickness gives you the stress, the shear stress on every stringer. Now that you have the shear stress on every, str every stringer, you can now calculate the one that's the highest. The buckling loading for truncated cones, you're gonna encounter that a lot. Uh, you can look at this paper here, is the SP8019. That'll give you some sizing information on buckling. But basically the critical buckling load can be found to be two pi ET squared cosine squared alpha divided by the square root of three, one minus no squared. That's the axial uh, buckling load. One thing I wanna mention here, gamma here is considered to be a correction factor. What happens is that shells that have imperfections are not gonna match test data because it, the test, the flight article, the test article when it's tested is gonna have imperfections. And this tip analysis does not know anything about imperfection. So it needs to be corrected by this gamma factor, which is provided on this SP8019. The critical bending moment also is provided. And you can find, uh, you'll use the R1. R1 here is the, this radius over here at the top. Uh, and you can calculate the critical bending moment. And, and again, this document here will provide you with the formulas. There's a lot of formulas in 8007. SP8007 as well as SP8019. So I'm just showing you an example so you know uh, what to look for, but you have to look for your case study. For example, if this alpha is 15 degrees, that's what you plug in here. No is a Poisson ratio, E is the modulus, T is the thickness, and gamma is a correction factor to account for the difference between experiments and analysis because the experiments do have imperfections in the shell and that drives the buckling mode a buckling behavior, while in analyses, you don't have that uh, imperfection. So you have to somehow correct it and people have come up with the correction factors. Scientists and engineers have worked together to come up with that. There's other configurations you can analyze and you will have to use a stress works handbook. Here's another website that could be very helpful, uh, but in general, you're gonna, you're gonna have various configurations for various designs and can quickly calculate the stresses, hoop and axial and so forth, depending upon what configuration you have. And you have to find the configuration within the stress works handbook. And the other approach is very, fairly simple. If you already know the diameter of the design, go ahead and create a quick finite element model. I have a number of abacus tutorials you can check out. And over there, you can see that we can quickly create a number of shell models and quickly change the thickness, no problem, and figure out which is the best that gives you the best, uh, uh, the lowest. Basically, you want a lightweight structure so you can optimize the thickness and the material to get the best uh, performance you want. Also, I'd, I recommend using the pressure vessel design manual uh, as one approach. And I also encourage the use of a software called Hypersizer. That could be, can be very beneficial in the design of structures. And given the loads, given the bending moment, given the axial load, you can then go and, and try to use a code that can optimize the design for you. 
but it is not very difficult with today's codes. You can do some of that by hand, but the finalization of the design will be done through a computer software. So I hope this comes all together for you. These stresses are then compared. Again, these stresses now represent the limit loads. They're statistically uh, significant now because uh, these are the highest stresses that the structure could experience. So once you get this number, you're pretty much there now because that stress is now compared to the, uh, is multiplied by the factor of safety. And then you take that, those calculations along with the strength allowable, which is an A basis or B basis, and then you calculate margin of safety. This is a general procedure on how to go about this. And uh, we'll keep moving now to aircraft design. 